you refer to scripture, the divine office, as well as you know mathematics, Einstein, uh, even cricket. You mean even cricket? Cricket? <laughs> well, you know, Your Eminence, I, I lived in London for two years, and I had people on a monthly basis try to explain cricket to me, and I, I confess that it, it escaped me. But uh, I fear that you're a bit like the Italians. They determined they are not going to understand cricket, and they just make that declaration of faith and continue in that line. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McCaig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, it's Tuesday, which means in the Catholic Current, it's Timely Tuesday. Lively guest and I have an open-ended conversation about hot headlines affecting the church and the world. And in the last segment, it's you and me sharing timely thoughts on what we learned today. One of the reasons why I, I like working in this medium is because I get to meet interesting people and then I get to meet them again. And a case in point, my, my guest today is a Catholic convert from monasticism. He has a PhD in public affairs and public policy, and he has an important website you should check out called Return to Tradition. Anthony Stein, welcome back to the Catholic Current. Thank you for having me on again, Father. It's appreciated. Anthony, and I want to give a tip of the hat to the quality of your work. You're very carefully sourced. You're uh, you're not histrionic. I've never heard you say anything uncharitable in your end, and I just want to acknowledge that. I want to offer you my respect for that. Well, well, thank you. I do remember distinctly getting visibly, like, noticeably angry once in a video of mine, and people in the comments were like, "Whoa, this is unusual. You should chill out a little bit." <laughs> I don't even remember what the topic was, but it was one of those things that made me want to pull my hair out. Well, I, I yeah, I, I think that's refreshing too, and I try to maintain my composure. I, I, there's so many things that I, that I want to talk about today, but I want to go back to uh, a series of videos you've done about Catholic prophecy, and it was called "We Were Warned," and there is uh, someone on that list who I know is a fascinating figure. I've only scratched the surface of her writings, and there are people who know her primarily through her music, and that's uh, St. Hildegard of Bingen, who was recently named a Doctor of the Church by Pope Benedict. You did a video some time ago about her prophecies, and I think it's not only a curiosity, I think it may be relevant to our circumstances today. Can you open that up for us, please? Sure. So... I have, you know, some short biographies of her open here, like the, you know, the online kind that I can look at while we're talking. But she was a, uh, a German abbess. She was a visionary, mystic, and she was a composer. If you were to, you know, the typical Catholic going to the ordinary form of the Mass will probably find in their hymnal next somewhere next to the Marty Haugen hymns are going to be some written by St. Hildegard, you know, 900, to th- almost a thousand years ago. She's, you know, she was a Benedict, she was a Benedictine abbess. She come, came from nobility and a, by all accounts, was having visions and mystical experiences all the way back to her early, early, early childhood. Hmm. So, these are not the types of things we typically hear much about either when no. we talk about her. Like you were telling me that you were mostly familiar with her as a composer. Right. And she's written some of the most beautiful, like iconic traditional hymns that you'll ever encounter. It's haunting. Yes. Um, but her visions, and I, I have to think that Benedict XVI would have taken into account her vol- voluminous a body of, of visions that she had in the process of canonization, even if there isn't really a devil's advocate used anymore. Mm-hmm. I would think that they would have at least read those and to right. see if there's anything that would have caused scandal, because if there would have been, they probably would not have canonized her, even though right. she had been treated as a saint for many centuries in the sort of the pre-formal canonization process, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. popular devotion kind of saint. But she was mm-hmm. formally canonized just five years ago. Okay, so uh, she's a, a saint. I mean, obviously a, a woman of holiness, a, an extraordinary prayer. Why did you do a, a video on her? And can you connect the dots between what she said then? Because I listened to your video recently, and it's it's kind of a, a, a kind of like the the extended play version of the of the apocalypse of the book of of Revelation. Why why were you interested in her prophecies, and what the, what does it say to us today? Well. I see everything. I see all of Catholic prophecy, or at least I judge it all, against the standard of Fatima and Akita. And the reason Mm -hmm. I put Our Lady of Akita up there is because then Cardinal Ratzinger in the 1980s said the message of uh, Akita was essentially the third secret of Fatima. 
Hmm. And right. And this is something people don't know. And then when you take, which is why when I hear the officially released 2000 message of what Fatima was about, and then the message of Our Lady of Akita, they don't sound the same. They sound similar, but they don't sound the same. Right. But I take those two, I take Fa- the message of Fatima and I take the message of Akita sort of, and uh, Our Lady of Buen Successo, mm-hmm. you know, Our Lady of Good Success, very terrible translation of her message. Her, hers would be properly translated as Our Lady of the Good Event of the Purification, okay. which is a really, really ominous sounding name for Marian apparition. But yes. I take the, like a core four or five of these Marian apparitions from the seven, 17th century onward. Mm-hmm. And then I judge the non-Marian apparitions against them. And St. Hildegard sounds like it would fit in rather well with what we know of Fatima, what we know of Akita and the others. And so that's why I sort of focused on them. Not because I'm trying to like, you know, paint a forcibly paint a picture of what's probably coming our way. Mm -hmm. But when you put these all together, you do get kind of a vague picture, sort of a, a picture seen through stained glass windows, right? Right. If you've ever like looked outside of a Paris that still has actual proper stained glass, you can kind of see what's on the other side, but it's distorted. Right. right, But you still get an idea. And that's kind of what I feel like you do when you're looking at these approved and even some of the more controversial visions and myst of mystics. Well, st- sticking with uh, with Hildegard, uh, what she had to say was something that we, we've heard uh, a lot of recently. That says, "Gosh, this you know, if if it doesn't repeat, if history doesn't repeat itself, it does rhyme nicely." She talks about a widespread loss of faith, a widespread um, uh, corruption of clergy and religious loss of access to to the sacraments. Can you give us kind of a, a point by point of what she said? You know, almost a thousand years ago now, and how it might apply to to our, the specifics of our time. Oh yeah, I have, on my screen right now, on my computer, I have open just verbatim what she said on some of these things, and some might try to dismiss some of this as saying, "Well, she was living through the." Um, I'm going to put this one delicately. The time when the papacy was being controlled by illicit women, we'll say, <laughs> uh, okay, right, women of ill repute. You're aware of that period, right? Sure, the, sure. Yeah, she was. She was born in 1198, and that was like right after all of that okay. had been resolved. The time of Saint Peter Damien. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we're talking that period of church, that really fun period of church history where the popes right, right. we don't really talk about much. Right. Um, but again, these things tend to not. The, these past controversies in the church, these past scandals, almost prophetically point to what we're going through now. There's nothing new under the sun, which is why I recommend people read the Book of Gomorrah by St. Peter Damien, if you really want to understand Ted McCarrick and everything around that. But so I can read some of this for you here, though, what yes, she please. said, because some of this will sound, if you're not paying attention carefully, like she's talking about her own time, but they're not. Mm-hmm. So here's a, here's a brief excerpt. She, here she says, The time is coming when princes and people will renounce the authority of the Pope. Individual countries will prefer their own church rulers to the Pope. The German Empire will be divided. Church property will be secularized. Priests will be persecuted. After the birth of Antichrist, heretics will preach their false doctrines undisturbed, resulting in Christians having doubts about their holy Catholic faith. Now, a lot of people will say that that sounds like the Protestant Reformation. But right. unless the you know the Antichrist, and this is she's saying capital A Antichrist, as in from the Apocalypse of Saint John, mm-hmm. you know that'll be after the birth of Antichrist, heretics will preach their false doctrines undisturbed. Meaning this is all this is all in the same passage, which sounds to me like this is all to be taken at the same time. Okay, and that sounds like our time, but I make no claims that we're living in the time where the Antichrist is quietly walking around behind the scenes. Because oh, okay, well, we, yeah, no we, we don't that. know. Yeah, we don't know the day or the hour, and I I, I tend to be Precisely. extremely modest uh, about those sorts of things. But you know, the idea that hey, there might be ecclesiastical mischief coming out of Germany. Hmm. I, I just mm-hmm. saw a, a meme before we we went on the air together. I was looking at the computer, and there was Martin Luther nailing his theses to to the the door of the cathedral, and it, and it reads as someone who went to Catholic schools. <laughs> I saw that too. <laughs> Uh, hey, that's. Uh... <laughs> I think that has to do with the recent controversies surrounding surrounding the alleged correction that's coming of Joe Biden, which I'm sure we'll get to later. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we're, we're going to do that in, in the next segment as well. But you know, uh, someone had, had said, you know, Aristotle's wrong. Man's not a rational animal; he's a rationalizing animal. And I think that sometimes mm-hmm. we're willing to to tinker with holy writ, we're willing to tinker with revelation and sacred tradition, so that we we can uh, we we can get our our way. Does that ring true to you, or am I being too am I being too jaundiced in my old age? 
I think that you saw that in that debate with people saying, well, I'm according to my well-formed conscience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. which if – pro tip, folks, if your well-formed conscience doesn't find a way to – doesn't uh, align with the church, what the church has to say, then you don't have a well-formed conscience. Right, That's right. Sort of, I, I, because I've written for the about church, that extensively, yeah. For the church's claims to be true, you have to align your, your beliefs with the church. Otherwise, what's the point? At right. The end of the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the appeal to conscience is not a get out of jail free card. Uh, you know, the R- Ring Lardner has a, a, very, a very funny short story where the uh, young boy asks his father an impertinent question. The reply is, shut up, he explained. And we can't invoke conscience in that way because conscience, that's why. Stop asking questions. That is absolutely not what conscience means. Conscience is conforming my life to what is true about God and man, which is accessible to unaided reason as well as aided by divine revelation. Friends, when we come back, we we'll continue our conversation with Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. It's Timely Tuesday here at the Catholic Current. In the next segment, we're going to talk about how the bishops kept themselves busy in the United States last week. I'm sure it'll be a very lively conversation. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo, Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so, for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. After the broadcast today, go to the station of the cross.com, get our resources list, download our audios podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. Together, we'll take it around the world. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live. It is Christ's church. He will build it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it's time for us, the remnant, to step up and do everything we can. Tune in from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern for Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross and our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. You can also watch the video stream every day on Facebook or on YouTube. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. On this timely Tuesday here at the Catholic Current, my returning guest, my very welcome returning guest, is Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. Anthony, you and I, I'm sure we're following closely. Uh, the bishops had their semi annual annual meeting. It was in June. It was still done by Zoom because the the season of COVID tide is not yet completed. I I look forward to that blessed event. They had a lot to, uh, they had a lot to say. Yesterday, we had my my friend Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas, give us his, uh, he was there, he was an eyewitness. And he, he, um, I, I urge you and your listeners to listen to the conversation Bishop Olson and I had yesterday. Be very edified. What about what about you? What's your take on what happened uh, there this, last week? I was left very uncomfortable by the fact that one retired bishop, I can't remember which bishop it was, a, a bishop emeritus who, who through the Zoom meeting, which I mean first, the fact that it was done through Zoom, made me kind of sad, but Mm -hmm. um, he asked that a formal sort of censuring of the, of the president of the United States be made. And no, not one person out of the 300 bishops there would second it. Hmm. And then he asked if somebody, and then he was informed that because he's an emeritus bishop, that he can't, that he doesn't actually have the right in in the body to make a a motion. So he asked somebody else to do it for him and not, and you could have heard a pin drop, but that having been said, the fact that they that seventy five percent of them voted in the affirmative to have a formal che- teaching document promulgated, possibly maybe <laughs> tonight mm-hmm. at the November mm-hmm. meeting, right. is a positive sign. Because even if they don't make any mention of Catholic politicians, which I highly doubt that they're going to, right? At the end of the day, we know from the data that only like one in three Catholics believes in the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist, right? 
That's shocking. And people, every time I bring that up in one of my videos with the citation to the Pew Research, people are like, well, I don't trust polls after the election. I get it. This is not something Pew would have a reason to lie about, though. This is something, you know, Pew did this on behalf of the bishops. You want to make sure, you know. Like, even if Pew Research were wrong by 50%, that's appalling still. It, it, it's still appalling. You know, if you're a Catholic of the age of reason, you should be able to give a coherent teaching of, of the Eucharist. Full stop. And if, right. if we're not at that standard, then a lot of people have failed and a lot of people have a whole lot to, to answer for. So, and, and you know, I, I think the, the present controversies generate a lot of confusion. I'm sure you read the document, uh, as did I, of uh, 60 members of Congress, Democrats and self-described Catholics, uh, signed a statement of principles that lend itself to confusion. Two, two points of interest, and I'll ask for your comment. One is, we're part of a living tradition, and then the other was, because conscience. Uh, your response to those points, please. I don't know how anybody can claim to have a well-formed conscience when, they're, when we're talking about abortion. Right. My gut instinct, my almost reflex, is to describe what it is in graphic detail, but for the sensibilities of your audience and right. <laughs> your partners, I will not do so. Okay. And I don't understand how somebody, how a group of Catholics can, in good conscience, release a statement of principles that rejects the core principles of the Catholic Church in the modern world today. I just, I cannot see how they, do, how they can do that in good reason. Right. And I mean, I'm, what... I, I'm reminded of some of the reactions I saw online. There was a self-described Eucharistic minister. Now, for those not, for those who may not be aware, the actual title is the Extraordinary Minister of Holy Communion, and there's a right. whole lot of debate about that role in the parish. We'll avoid that here, I suspect. But yeah, for now, yeah. this is a person who came up and said on Twitter publicly with their full real name, and I think in their bio what diocese they served in, that they were an Extraordinary Minister of Holy Communion, and they said that the Eucharist is a symbol and that they will give the Eucharist to whoever they please, Catholic or Protestant, regardless of, of uh, you know, their standing in the church. I'm pretty sure that that's not the, that's not in harmony with what the oath of the oath they took when they received the commission to serve in that ministry. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, say that's that that's if they that 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 is if they I'm took assuming that, that happened I will, at all. I, I know I'm 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 showing my age by, and by I will, here's, those things. Before I moved to the traditional uh, Latin Mass, I, at one point I served the the most precious blood. Of our Lord at the Mass, and twice I did the actual body, and I every time I had a deep seated feeling like I was doing something wrong. So after the second time, I just stopped <laughs> doing that. Okay. Um, okay, and I was so focused on not spilling the blood mm-hmm. that you know I they kept I persisted in doing it. But my point with bringing that up is this: I never swore an oath. Hmm. They never had me do one. And we're talking about a fairly middle of the road to conservative leaning uh, ordinary form parish that was located in like the heart of the belly of the beast in Portland, Oregon under Mm. a good Bishop under Archbishop sample. So, and the priest I know, you know, I had my points of disagreement with him that I won't air here because it's not my place to do that. But I will say that I have seen him talk about purgatory and hell and I could see the very real belief in his eyes in these things when he would talk at our CIA programs about this otherwise decent priest with a very good permanent deacon no, no such oath. So I don't know that that's even a widespread practice anymore. Well, uh, alas, and that's that's some, that's another topic for for another time. So the gist of it for people who haven't been following this closely is, uh, you know, there, there's a new sheriff in town in Washington D.C., and they're primarily a particular party that is wildly enthusiastic about abortion. Uh, they they've never heard of an abortion they don't like. Uh, they can't imagine any legitimate restriction on abortion, and they want to use your money taken at gunpoint to pay for abortions. Now. Socrates, without the aid of revelation, could figure out this is grotesquely wrong. You can't not know that this is wrong. And one of the ways to get at it is to say, hey, um, how do you know when an abortion has worked? And then, oh, so why aren't you... um, why aren't you uh, voting for the Born Alive Protection Act? On and on. So I don't. Need, I don't have to invoke faith at all. I can do that through reason. But if you're saying that you hold all that the church teaches and you reject all that the church rejects, and you are willing to make a statement before God and man as you present yourself for Holy Communion, 
then there's a real problem when you can countenance the murder of children in the womb and demand that it be done at taxpayer expense. So I'm also concerned about the statement of principles because obviously they didn't write that themselves. Someone with theological training and someone with some real political sensitivities did a very nice job of writing that up. That's not good for souls. That's not good I would for really souls. like to know. I'd really like to know who wrote which, which priest wrote that father because I suspect it's a priest whose name we're familiar with hmm. because it has to be somebody who's connected to the all these politicians and to the probably to the Democratic Party's uh, congressional apparatus and that's going to be a short list of priests at the end of the day. That 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 may that may well be so, but I, I would just say that I I am so disturbed by how um, misleading. Uh, the document is, and also how carefully crafted it is. This is not the work of an amateur. I'll just say this much. In, in print and in broadcast, I'll be dressing uh, that, that matter further. Looking that further down the road, there's going to be another meeting in November. Presumably, the Committee on Doctrine for the U.S. Bishops Conference is going to have some kind of document saying, hey, here's our national teaching document about Eucharist and, and Holy Communion and Eucharistic coherence, a, a phrase that has an interesting lineage. Uh, what, what do you think is going to come of that document? I saw something from a figure who I won't name, and I saw this on Twitter, someone who is weirdly connected given what they do for a living and who has a huge following online. It, it's something that they said that I normally completely would disagree with them on, but here I think they're right. And my suspicion is that there's going to be an opportunity for the for the for some of the bishops to punt on this, because there is a synod, a mega synod coming up, the 2023, you know, synod that ha has national synods and then brought to the church as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I suspect someone is going to suggest that they hold off on this in the name of unity with Rome. And, and also if they the, the 2022 election, some of my more cynical friends say, we, we've, we've got to keep this off the table until after the 2022 elections. Right. But then what happens What happens uh, the day after the 2022 elections are resolved? The well, 2024 presidential elections begin. Well, yeah. And then, and I'm a political scientist. That's, what, that's how this goes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I know how that goes too. But, you know, lives are at risk. And souls are at risk. And really, the, the honor of the Virgin Bride of Christ is at risk. If, if someone wants to muzzle the Bride of Christ, who is both mother and teacher, I have to object. That can't be right. You know, I have a lot to answer for in my particular judgment. I don't want on that list, I kept silent uh, about this issue. That's, that's wrong. I'm going to have to answer to God for what I do in the coming weeks and days in response to this. Um, I'm, I'm fired and I'm pretty sober uh, on the air. Um, Anthony, if, if you listen to me long enough, I'm, I'm fine. I'm struggling to maintain my composure at this point. I, I don't blame you. It's the, from the, the just from the lay, our lay co-religionists who are not mm -hmm. public servants, the reaction is appalling and it makes me tempted to think that we're in the great apostasy. I say tempted because if I, I it, it the, the dark thought I have is that this is just a dress rehearsal. What we're saying here is just when that happens, if it's in our lifetime, we'll look back on this and go, those were the good old days. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I am very concerned. And since we're talking about uh, Hildegard of Bingen and some of her, her prophecies, we have, you know, we have a lot to answer for. We There, there are some questions that God is, is going to ask us. And did we tell the truth? And, you know, the truth really does liberate. It really does heal. It really does set us free. And, and, and the truth is Christ himself. There is yeah. My, my my mentor in philosophy, the, the late Paul Weiss, was was an agnostic, and he said, if you can believe, if you can really believe in Christ, you get to participate in a miracle. How could you give yourself only partially to to a miracle? What what are your thoughts on that? I, it's it goes back to the my the difficulty I've wrapping my head around the fact that. The lines to the confessional are short and the lines to the Eucharist every Sunday are very long. Yes. And I can never point – I can't point the finger at any single person in line to receive our Lord in the sacrament mm -hmm. and say, what are you doing there? But 
the, the lines at the typical parish are short. And this is why the, you know, confession is so rarely available. I mean, I saw a listing for a, for a typical like suburban parish from the forties or the fifties and the, the mass times and the confession times available mm-hmm. were astonishing. Most oh. of us would trip over ourselves to be able to have a 5.30 a.m. weekday mass in a parish staffed by five priests in a typical suburban place. Wow. That sounds like fantasy land to us, but it was how it was at one point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we get what we deserve with this. And again, it's mm-hmm. the, it's a, I think it goes back to people not really understanding what it means for the real presence. And I don't pretend to be an expert to really fully grasp because that's not on this side of heaven possible. Right. That, that, that's, that's a mystery. And we'll, we'll, we'll take up the conversation mystery in the next segment. Friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation on this Timely Tuesday with Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. In the next segment, we're going to have kind of an open-ended conversation of misunderstanding the Eucharist means we misunderstand nearly everything else important. Lots of dominoes fall if we don't get this right. We'll be back in two minutes. Stay with us. This is the Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. It's Timely Tuesday here at the Catholic Current. Lively guest and I are talking about hot headlines affecting the church and the world. My welcome and returning guest is Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. Anthony, in the last segment, we were talking something about the Eucharist as mystery. We ran into the break, and I, I want to go back to that, but I want to offer you a, a, an analogy. In my medical ethics class, people ask me, why do we talk so much about sex? I said, well, sexuality is a comprehensively human issue, and if you get it right, then nearly every other human issue falls into place, and if you get it wrong, nothing fits. By analogy, the Eucharist is both a comprehensively divine and comprehensively human issue. And if you get it right, many of the pieces of the puzzle regarding God and man fall into place. And if you get it wrong, nothing fits. Do you think that's a fair assessment? It is. And I think that's why virtually every Protestant sect out there rejects the real presence Mm -hmm. or they redefine it to fit the rest of their theology. It's because like I'm never hidden the fact, anybody who listens to my work knows that I'm not exactly the biggest fan of the Second Vatican Council, but the phrase that comes out of the council that I actually really do like is that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith. Yeah. It's sort of an incarnation brought to brought real to our eyes if we have the eyes of faith to see every time we go to Mass. And it's one of the reasons I hated Mass being streamed on telev- or on the internet during the pandemic. I absolutely hated it because it turned it into a television show. Right. It separated the you being truly and really present at the holy sacrifice of the mass and put up a separation, a digital a digital wall of separation between you and the miracle that was happening in front of your eyes. And it's why, you know, I don't hide the fact that often I don't go up to I don't I don't go to receive and I don't say that to be like, oh look at me, how holy I am. Oh, let's please pray for me. I, you know, need to go to confession for the you know the same stuff all the time which you as a priest who've heard probably your fair share of confessions over the years mm-hmm. you'll probably uh, second what i say here which was a priest once told me that most people have their one or two things that they go to confession for over and over again and it's you know yeah a lot of people go to confession for the same things but everybody's got their particular sins that they mm-hmm. most of the time will go to confession for repeatedly and feel like they're going to give up on and if that's you which probably is don't give up <laughs> deepen right. your prayer life and stay close to the sacraments, which is one of the reasons why I was so outraged last year when parishes or when dioceses shut down baptism and confession. 
more so that, even in the Eucharist because the baptism yeah. opens the door to the Eucharist and the, and the confessional keeps the door open to the Eucharist. Why right. would you take those from people? And what happens when someone dies without those sacraments? Right. I, 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 found, that, I found that boggling. And there was a, a, a prominent American hierarch who said you can only perform emergency baptisms without his, with, with his permission. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> if it's an emergency – so, so, but anyway, I, I want to. Yes, I'm going to have the car. I'm going to have the cardinals. I'm going to have the, this cardinal that we're talking about's fo- number on speed dial at this uh, car right. crash. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I, I, I don't understand people sometimes. But I, I, I will, I will say this much. If we take that sense of the Eucharist as the source and summit of our lives, and we often tell that to young people, I'd say, what reason do we give them to believe us? that it really is the source and summit of our lives. Case in point, I was uh, my very great privilege to be the, the priest at a solemn high mass uh, at a parish, assisted very ably by, by two religious priests serving as deacon and subdeacon. And the preparations for it took hours and hours. And I said, you really would think that this is the source and summit of our lives. It is the most important thing we do before we enter eternity. And contrast that with, you know, sweat-stained polyester smelly vestments and Marty Haugen hymns and what we rhapsodize about liturgy in the vernacular. And I said, is it the liturgy in the vernacular that makes you wear your faded Led Zeppelin t-shirt to mass with your flip-flops? Anyway, I, I don't want to get far afield from that. I, no. I will say this much. If, if we're not worshiping properly, if we don't get our relationship with God correct, we're in trouble uh, case in point, we're, we're in absolute confusion about marriage, uh, aren't we? And one of the things I, I want to bring up, a, a friend of mine uh, sent to me, in Waterford, Ireland, people were, were putting up so, some posters which uh, made people very upset. It shows a, a you know, newly married couple, she's still in her brighter gown, and it says, straight pride, it's natural, it worked for thousands of years, and you can make babies. Well, that <laughs> seems rather obvious to me, you don't need special revelation for that. But it's um, it's caused a hissy fit in Waterford, and, and recently someone had found that poster, and it's posted on the airport in, in Denver, and it's caused a consternation <laughs> there. Why are things like it's obvious that men and women are made for each other and to make babies for uh, human civilization and for citizenship in heaven? What has gone wrong that those very obvious statements that we used to take until grant t- taken for granted until very recently? Now it's considered hate speech. Where did we go wrong spiritually? What does it say about us that stating the obvious is being denounced? Rejecting, we rejected God as a people, and rejecting God leads down the road to madness. And I'm reminded of one of those apocryphal sayings that we're not really quite sure where it came from. And, and it is, you know, before God destroys a people, He first drives them mad, or something. Right. You know which one I'm. You know what I'm right, saying? Yeah. Which, which, Wh- whom the uh, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Yes. Right. And if that's a pagan saying, it's 100% yes, it on point, <laughs> right. you know, because we all, I suspect if you really get people in a, in a place where they will candidly tell the truth, whether that requires a couple of, you know, a couple of beers in them or just one on one in private, they will candidly tell you that they sense that we're headed towards something and it's not good. Right. And the other one is um, saying, I believe it may have, it was, I think St. Anthony of Padua, but it may have been a different St. Anthony who said, that uh, there will come a time where, you know, the – let me find this quote. I don't, I don't want to butcher this one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no, it, it's, it, it's important that we be really clear about what is most important. And what is most important is being in right relationship with God because it's only when we're in right relationship with God that I can face my neighbor and say, because of who you are – to God, and because of who God is, I choose to serve you and respect you, and I even choose to restrain my selfish impulses and try to get along with you, even if I don't like you, because of who God is and who you are to God. Take away that foundational core, and then it's it's welcome to, to the jungle. Any luck in finding that, that quote? No, but it was essentially a quote saying that um, there will come a time where people will be basically openly mad and the people who are mad will look at those who are not and say, you are mad. You are not like us. Right. Well, alas. And like we are, I mean, it's vague enough that it could apply to many times in history. Sure. It certainly has that whiff of our age. Oh, certainly. No, no, there, there, there is, there is no doubt about that. Uh, and then likewise, um, 
if, you know, St. Paul said, if our hope is for this life only, we are the most pitiable of men. And w- what happens when we have only this world to, to look forward to? Well, then we get hysterical if we think we're going to get sick and die. And we're also going to demand too much of each other. I mean, the people who were running about uh, setting fires while thirsting for justice, as the saying goes, uh, chanted, no justice, no peace. And I said, well, then there's going to be no peace. Because when you involve finite fallen human beings, you can't ever have perfect justice. Only God is perfectly just, and we don't want to face him because we've also bastardized what mercy means uh, as well. So, Anthony, we, we seem to be in a fix. I have a hunch about what what needs to be done, but I, I want to hear from you first. To, rest, to restore order with the Eucharist, to restore order in the world. <laughs> right, right, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, obviously, something wrong must have gone somewhere. Whatever we're doing, it hasn't been working for a good long time. You know, the, the, the case in point, the other day, the bishops received a message. They said, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I said, that's nonsense. It, whether you're alone or together, fast or slow, near or far, if you're going in the wrong direction, turn around. That has to be right. the first step. I would say we've been going in the long, wrong direction for a long time. We're coming up towards the cliff. What do we do to turn that around? As a people, we need to return back to God and restore, you know, little o orthodoxy in our church. Right. And we need to be out there preaching the gospel. And the, one of the most, I think, crimes against a saint ever committed, there's this belief out there that St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times use words if you need to right? or use words when necessary. Yeah. He never said that. In fact, that misapplied quote is literally the opposite of what he did in life. Right. He went to the Saracens. He went to the head of like to a, tur- uh, to a high profile Turkish leader and preached the gospel to his face, hoping to get martyred. Well, that, this is not, not a, something That's not said. a great approach to dialogue, is it? <laughs> Apparently not. A no dialogue and accompaniment with St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> okay. uh, for a concrete things that your faithful listeners can can do, Our Lady mm-hmm. of Fatima said that we should that we are to keep the five first Saturdays devotion. Go and make reparation to Our Lady's uh, Immaculate Heart by following the five first Saturdays. You can find a how-to all over the internet or go to my channel I've got on YouTube, th- at least mm-hmm. three videos on how to do this. And I, which means I'm t- due for another one because I've dedicated myself to trying to promote the five first Saturdays right. because as part of the Fatima message, most people have never heard of that. That's true. And the trick to keeping the five first Saturdays devotion is you have to find a mass that has having a special first Saturday of the month mass devoted to that, mm-hmm. which is extremely rare. Right. It's not as rare among in like traditional parishes, you know, your FSSP or Institute Christ the King or all the other groups mm-hmm. typically will have that. I haven't seen too many diocesan TLMs or diocesan like Nova Sordo parishes doing it, but they do exist. Okay, that's one thing you can uh, also. It's June, the month of the Sacred Heart. You can keep the the nine first Fridays. It's a bit harder to do the nine first Fridays because you have to commit right. to going to a again a special mass dedicated to it on the first Friday of the month every month. Right. <laughs> so right. you may want to, if you want to make a difference, pursue sanctity. And those are two wonderful mechanisms for doing that. And also get in the habit of going to confession every other week if you're not already. And if you're yes. already going every other week, work towards every week. The saints right. went at least every week, sometimes more right. often, because they lived in a time where they had the access to the sacraments more often. Right. No, I, I'm in full agreement with you. It is time to practice at least basic spiritual hygiene. And I've heard people rhapsodize about, gosh, in the past year, I've washed my hands more than I have in the past 10 years. Well, that that's fine. Right? But we, we you know, the, the only great reset worthy of the name is going to confession. Yeah, I agree with Father Z that nearly every the, the solution to nearly everything starts with go to confession. You know, wear your scapular, your miraculous medal, commit to praying the rosary every day. You've got to immerse yourself in scriptures uh, every day. And you've got to find like-minded friends with whom you can begin to offer the spiritual and the corporal works of mercy. Because uh, things are going to get worse before they get worse. And we're, we're going, and the thoughts of many are being revealed. I've seen that in the past year and a half. Honest to goodness, I don't like what I see. And I, this I, is why they, this is why I've said that my favorite thing about the previous president was despite his, what my policy differences with, with him, mm-hmm. he, there was something about him that caused the mask to slip from the other side. We're seeing just, they're just taking the mask off at this point. And it's really spooky hearing arco religionists say some really heinous things about abortion that you would never think that they would say. 
Well, well, one, one prominent co-religionist who are, occupies a significant place in the federal government, when asked if the child in the womb of 15 weeks is human, she didn't, didn't even do the, the two-step of human but not person. She said, I've always been a big supporter of Roe versus Wade. And, you know, I have standing to talk about this because I had five children in six years. And I thought to myself... <laughs> You're talking about the need for abortion as backup contraception, which back in the 70s, we were told we were haters forever suggesting. I want to say, all right, you had five kids in six years. Um, which one's existence do you regret? See, they say these horrible things. And they have no idea how far reaching their words and their policies are. Uh, Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition, God bless your good work. I'm grateful for your time today. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you for having me on, Father. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague. You want to stay with us in the rest of the hour in this Timely Tuesday. In the last segment, it's just you and me sharing timely thoughts, reflecting on what we've heard today. After the broadcast, go to the station of the cross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast, be part of the conversation, and follow us on Gab. That's G A B dot com. Our channel is called The Catholic Current. Take this conversation to your family and friends, and together we'll take it around the world. We'll be right back. Stay with us. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. It's Timely Tuesday here at the Catholic Current. It means in the last segment, it's just you and me reflecting on what we've heard today, sharing timely thoughts. My, my guest for the first portion of the show was Anthony Stein of Return to Tradition. Org. We began talking about the alarming apocalyptic prophecies of St. Hildegard of Bingen, and then began to be talking about what's taking place in the church and the world today. And you already know. You already know. There's, you have to look really hard to find good news. You have to look really hard to find headlines that will make you want to jump up and sing a few rousing choruses of, he's got the whole world in his hands. I, I, I understand that. And honestly, I've been very disturbed by some of the public statements made by my, my co-religionists, people in public life who identify as Catholic, and then say and do things that, objectively speaking, are inimical to Catholic faith and morals, and invoke words like conscience and living tradition and so on. You know, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for almost 20 years. I spent nearly all of my adult life on the univer in the university campuses and in the classroom on both sides of the podium. And I'm a preacher. I've been ordained a priest almost 25 years. I live and die for preaching. I'm a minister of the Word. And as a Jesuit trained in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, I take spiritual warfare very seriously. Now, not dramatic exorcist Linda Blair spitting pea soup kind of evil, though that's real, and it's happening more often than a lot of people realize nowadays. But I'm talking about ordinary bread and butter, nuts and bolts, garden variety evil. Uh, and in this way, the human capacity to lie to ourselves and to one another is astonishing. Aristotle said that man is a rational animal. I read recently someone said, no, man's not a rational animal. He's a rationalizing animal. We spend a lot of our soul power 
a lot of our imagination, our intellect, and our will making excuses making excuses for why we should not obey the natural law, why God doesn't mean what he said, and why we should not follow Christ crucified, risen, and reigning, why we should not stay faithful to him to glorious victory or honorable death. And candidly, I'm a sinner. I go to confession as often as I can. I know what it's like to lie to yourself, to kid yourself, to use your your education and your imagination to make excuses for bad behavior. I've seen it in my own life, I've seen it in the people I've served, and I've seen it in my study of history, and frankly I'm seeing it today and I'm seeing too much of it. It's not good for souls. It is not good for souls. God is not glorified when we tolerate the culture of what Solzhenitsyn called the, the total lie. He said, let the, let the lie enter through the, into the world, but not through me. And I know that lives are at risk and souls are at risk and the honor of the virgin bride of Christ is sullied and the glory of God is diminished when we tolerate nonsense and lies, especially from people who really should know better and especially from the enablers of those who help the people who should know better. Well, what about that? I don't like to talk about myself on the air. I'm actually a very private person. I'm an introvert. It's God's little joke on me that this kid who grew up shy with a speech impediment now teaches homiletics and rhetoric and broadcasts and preaches. But it's what God asks of me. And I believe, at the risk of sounding like an evangelical, that God has laid a burden on my heart that I need to be more of a teacher in my broadcasting. I need to be more explicit about taking what I've learned from being a teacher over the decades and put it to use. One of the things I wanted to do in the classroom was to give everyone kind of a a, a mental toolbox, a portable Swiss army knife or Leatherman multi-tool, so that when you hear something that doesn't sound right, you could take it apart, put it together again and say, it's wrong. And here's why it's wrong. I need to start doing that more on the air. I want to dedicate more time to saying, here's some nonsense that I found. It may sound wrong to you. Let me go through it line by line, word by word, so that you can have a sense of why it's wrong, so that eventually you can develop those habits and skills yourself. You know, I wrote my book, Real Philosophy for Real People, and I pitched it as a lie detector and a truth detector and a lie refuter and a truth promoter. I still believe that's true. I still believe that's necessary. And I want to start doing that more on the air. So watch this space in coming days and even this week because I want to do a few things differently. I want to do, I want to offer an account of why we should be concerned and why we don't have to sit idly by when people are lying to us. I think we have an obligation to those great mystics and teachers and heroes and martyrs who suffered unspeakably to bring the gospel here to these shores across the miles and the years. We owe them a debt of gratitude. And honestly, too, there is there's a debt we owe to the future. I don't want future generations to judge what we've done here and say, why didn't you do more to hand on the faith to us intact? Why didn't you prepare a culture so that we could have a fighting chance of remaining faithful? I know that Cardinal Ratzinger paraphrased uh, a, a sentence from Cardinal Newman, and I want to read it to you here. So this is my summation of Ratzinger summarizing Newman. He says, the man of conscience is he who never succumbs to indulgence, well-being, success, public prestige, and the approval of public opinion at the expense of the truth. End quote. By God's grace, I've been given a good vocation and a good education and a really wide platform. And Christ our Lord is going to ask me about my particular judgment, which is going to take a long time because I've been a sinner for most of my life. He's going to ask me, did you tell the truth in 2021, in mid-year, when there were nonsense and lies about the gospel, about the sacraments, about public life, about conscience, did you tell the truth? More than that, 
Did you tell the truth in a way that it can be received, not just dropping truth bombs like cinder blocks on people's heads and then dismissing them as stupid or recalcitrant when they can't receive it, but giving them an opportunity to really learn? And did you make every effort to understand them? And by that, I don't mean false dialogue. I mean a dialectic, a crossing of verbal swords, uh, what the medievals called the questionis disputate, the disputed questions. And did you give ordinary people who haven't had the gifts of your education and leisure for study, did you give them the means to identify lies and falsehoods and to keep them at arm's length and identify the truth so they can absorb it and know it and love it and live it and tell it and hand it on to the next generation? I'm pretty sure King Jesus is going to ask me that. And I ask for your prayers because I believe with my whole heart in light of recent prayer that this is what God is asking of me. Not simply to be a conversationalist on the air, although that's going to be the hallmark of the Catholic current, restoring the lost art of intelligent conversation. But it's time for me to be a more explicit teacher on the air. Uh, I ask for your intercession, that I might be prudent, that I might be virtuous, and that I might be regarded by the truth, who is Christ, the King I am sworn to serve. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague, your host here every day on The Catholic Current. Join us tomorrow. We're going to have another lively conversation. We're going to be talking about tax dollars at work, about expenditures, and about money going to ugly and unusual places. After the broadcast today, go to the stationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may mighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the station of the cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please prayerfully consider donating at the station of the cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.